Greetings, my fellow free motor seven thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful Swampy Mango of South Florida. And today's date is March 27th, 2018, on a Tuesday. It looks like spring break has simmered down in Fort Lauderdale. And I am transmitting the show at Squiggy's New York Pizzeria, located at 207 Southwest 2nd Street in the Himishi district of Fort Lauderdale. Check it out. You don't need a corporate chain pizza joints to get good food. Remember, if it's cheap and it means it's crappy, you get what you pay for. Yeah, so, um, did a little work today and took a nap. I'm thinking about doing another show. And I know I didn't leave any footnotes in my last few um, episodes. I do apologize for that because once again my computer has kicked the bucket. So I'm on my phone. It's all good. Show must go on as usual. I got a few here to talk about. It's interesting because I did a little post yesterday on um, a picture of Mr. Hogg, David Hogg. With uh, with his uh, little pony unicorn knapsack, it says, "From my cold, damp, my damp, soft hands." Like a parody of uh, Charles Hessens doing "From my cold, dead hands." So, from my damp, soft hands, I posted on Facebook. I do find that funny. I like good satire because um, you know, political stuff is great. Doesn't matter what side of paradigm I just posted on there. And I may have struck a nerve from one of the folks. I'm not going to condemn the man or anything like that. But it's very interesting when they went picking on kids. Big man. And I'm like thinking, like, wait a minute. If you got folks witch hunting, expect blowback. There's no exceptions. But many people liked it anyway. They just laughed. Because, hey, one thing for sure, if you're going to talk out of your talk smack and it's baseless and you're going to blame an organization or someone else for an individual's actions, you always get what's coming. If you, love to, if, you, if you love to dish it out, you better learn to receive. So I posted on Facebook, I think Twitter and Google+, Plus, but I do find it hilarious. Hey, I love humor. Political satire is great. Regardless of the paradigm, let Democrats and Republicans don't matter. I get them all. It's a good form of entertainment. But many of these people out there still have to realize who is benefiting from your so-called AstroTurf march for our lives. Purveyor, the biggest purveyor for violence is the state. Look at the bigger picture. But uh, but the whole thing is, I was not saying it's out of malice, but out of love and in good faith. Because we all let our emotions supersede logic. And it's disturbing because we got good folks out there, or families, that were there. And their kids are out in their school, what happened? Good old great amount of them passed. And I was still traumatized. And I talked about it on last day's episode. But like, so like I said, if you get a counter rally with, the, with this organization, use finesse, teach, be the rabbi, have knowledge handy, ready to go. Then and teach them, the te- I give them that rabbi attributes. Because Study, come study the past because it's today's greatest teacher. All right, enough of that. And it looks like there's a little friction going on too with um, Donald Trump appointing John Bolton, Bolin, for national security advisor. Dangerous indeed because he is a sort of warmonger, according to some of the sources are out there, which is pretty legit. 
And I wouldn't recommend it if it was like him in there because it's like having resurrecting Zygru Brzezinski. I mean, I talked about this yesterday, so sorry about that, folks. One of the areas they got the United States really got to focus on is have an honorable foreign policy. They got to threaten attack. That's a whole different ballgame. So, without further ado, everyone talk about the United States is anti-socialism and all that, but sometimes they, they do contradict themselves. And this one here came from Jacob C. Hornberger from the Future of Freedom Foundation, which is triple F, 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 F dot org, came out today. It's entitled, Abolish Radio Marty. As it reads here, while well, we are on the subject of Russia supposedly making meddling in the U.S. presidential election, wouldn't this be a good time to abolish Radio Marty, a U.S. government radio station whose purpose is to meddle in the internal affairs of Cuba? Yes, I know that Cuba is not a democratic country. Yes, I know it's ruled by a brutal, dic- brutal communist regime. But why does that authorize the U.S. government to meddle in Cuban affairs? After all, and after all, let's be honest. The aim of the U.S. government and the socialist radio station is not to bring democracy to Cuba, but rather to install a pro-U.S. dictator into power. If that can be done democratically, that's great. If not, then so be it. What matters all above else is that a pro-U.S. dictator rule over Cuba, Cuba, democratically or not, one who will do the bidding of U.S. officials. A good modern example of this phenomenon is Egypt, when Egyptian voters elected wrong can- the wrong candidate in a democratic election, the Egyptian National Security Establishment, went into action, ousted him from power, and resumed direct control over Egyptian society, with the full support of the U.S. government, which today furnishes the unelected military goons with millions of dollars in high-powered weapons that are used to maintain their brutal and tyrannical anti-democratic hold on power. For all you folks that support Never Again should listen up. Of course, it's not only the t- only time that U.S. officials have destroyed democratic regimes to put their dictators into power, Iran, Guatemala, and Chile come to mind. Think back to the dictator who ruled Cuba before Fidel Castro, Fulgencio Batista. Fulgencio Batista. Like Castro, he wasn't elected, and he was also corrupt and brutal. U.S. officials loved him. That's because he would do whatever U.S. officials order him to do in the international arena. In other words, that's their little butt boy. If they needed a vote in the U.N., they know that they could count on Batista to deliver. If they needed some sort of coalition of the willing, Batista was there to serve. In return, they gave free reign to Batista to do whatever was necessary to maintain his corrupt and tyrannical hold on power inside Cuba, just like they do with Egypt and just like they did with Iran, Guatemala, and Chile after their regime changed operations in those countries. Batista had lucrative partnership with the mafia, for example, that enabled it to own and operate gambling casinos in Havana and to use Cuba as a way station for the smuggling heroin in the United States. As part of the partnership, Batista would have his forces kidnap young girls in outlying areas and forcibly bring them to Havana to have sex with high rollers in the casinos. Interesting there, right? Absolutely. Wow, sex trafficking happening back then. I'll continue on here. If anyone expect, objected to, to the tyranny, corruption, and brutality, Batista wouldn't hesitate to have his forces haul them in, torture them, and even kill them. Ah, more things change, the more stay the same, right? That's why 
Cuban populace finally revolted against Cuba's pro-U.S. dictator. In fact, the rapes were what inspired Felicia Sanchez, who many Cubans recognize as the real leader of the Cuban Revolution. To take up arms against one of the U.S. government's favorite dictators, just like Iranian people did in 1979, against the dictator that the CIA officials gave them in 1953. That's Operation Ajax. U.S. officials brought Radio Marti into existence to broadcast propaganda to the Cuban people in the hopes of inspiring them to revolt against the Castro regime and replace it with another pro-U.S. dictator like Batista. It hasn't worked. After more than 30 years of broadcasting propaganda into Cuba, the Cuban Communist regime is still standing. And despite the manifest economic failure of socialism in Cuba, there are a little indication that the Cuban people are interested in replacing their communist regime with another brutal corrupt dictator who only make the U.S. a vassal of the U.S. government, of the U.S. government again. It is completely ironic that the U.S. government named its socialists, i.e., government-owned and government-funded radio station after Jose Marti, who, is Cuban, who Cubans recognize as their nation-funding hero and who was killed in the Spanish-American War. The irony is that Marti opposed not only Spanish control over Cuba, but also U.S. control over Cuba. Yet, here is a U.S. government-owned radio station that bears his name, whose our aim is to restore U.S. control over Cuba through the installation of a dictator who is who will take this marching order from Washington. Isn't it also ironic that the U.S. government is using socialism to combat communism? That's what a government-owned radio station is, socialism. Moreover, guess how Radio Marti is funded? It received its money from the federal government thanks to the coercive apparatus of the Federal Progressive Income Tax, a government program which also ironically is one of the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx. How contradictory is that, right? Perhaps it's worth mentioning that hardly anyone in Cuba listens to Radio Marti. One reason for that is that the Cuban government blocks the station's transmission to Cuba. But even if it don't, didn't, it is doubtful that Cubans would also would listen to it anyway because it, it, it's so boring. I periodically tune in to Radio Marti on Cyrus XM Radio and I have to be especially careful when I'm driving because the programming trends put me to sleep. So it's more like a Spanish version of NPR, right? Here's another irony about Radio Marti. I never heard the commentators railing against Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, public schooling, public housing, and other core socialist programs in Cuba. I wonder why is that? What businesses does a government that rails against foreign meddling in its affairs have meddling with affairs in Cuba? Iran, um, especially when it aims to simply to replace an independent dictator with one that is subservient to the U.S. government? What business does a government that purports to be anti-communist and pro-free enterprise and operating a radio station that, by its own admission, publishes official government propaganda? Abolishing Radio Marti would save American taxpayers around $27 million a year. Supporters of the social socialist program would say that that amount is just a drop in the bucket. That's true, but there is a lot of drops in the bucket that finally will fill the bucket up. Which ultimately leads out of control, spending, and debt that threatens our nation with bankruptcy, just like many communist countries. After more than a century of U.S. intervention against Cuba, it's time for the U.S. government to just leave Cuba alone. An easy place to start would be the abolition of America's socialist radio station, Radio Marti. To be very frank, I have to agree. And I look at all sides and what happened in that beautiful island. 
And it's a real shame when you got the folks are forced to take sides and things are almost the same. But like, oh, now we can get them, the supporters that don't like our Lord and Savior. But I read the parts of the Cuban Constitution. Of course, they were they do say they, they are against capitalism and Yankee imperialism. And even a person like myself is not lovey dovey with any forms of government, even in Cuba alone as well. But the truth of the matter is, the people in that island has to decide what they really want. I do support fair fair trade with that country. Embargo is just an act of war. Now the Cuban people are you learning to use technology. They have the opportunity to spread the truth on what's really going on in their own turf. I've been watching some of these uh, Latin American um, websites and uh, like some people court criticize their, their government to please come in and people are videotaping with their cell phones. That's a start, my friend. So there is a lot of questions. Not the majority, but a handful of people on that island are learning. Try to think for themselves a little bit more. I do find that essential because if people really want to liberate that island, they got to do it on their own free will, make it organic, not any interference. Radio Marti needs to be shut, shut down. Say at least $27 million, that will be a start. Ooh, yeah. So, as interesting there about Radio Marti. Okay, cool. Next one here, I'm be going to be addressing. Came from the Tenth Amendment Center. And it's some good news. New Kentucky laws put limits on drone spotting will help rock federal surveillance program. And this is by Mike Harry. I think that's right. Michael Harry. Yeah, Michael Meharry. Man from Kentucky. But it's good stuff here. It says here. This came out today, by the way. Last week, a bill requiring police to get a warrant before engaging in drone surveillance for most situations became law without the the government's signature. The new law not only establishes the important privacy protections at the state level, it will also help draw the federal surveillance state nullification. Representative Diane St. Ong, Republican from Lakeside Park, and... Representative Rangel Meeks, Democrat from Louisville, introduced Bill House Bill House Bill 22 on January 2nd. New law prohibits the use of drones for a search unless authorized under the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and Section 10 of the Kentucky Constitution. In effect, the officers will now have to get a warrant based on probable cause before gathering information with the drone in any situation that would require officers on the ground to have a warrant in order for the search to be valid. The warrant must specifically authorize the use of an unmanned aircraft system. The law requires police to minimize data collection on non-suspects and prohibits the disclosure of any such data without a court order. Any information collected in violation of the law is as inadmissible as evidence in any civil, criminal, or administrative proceeding in the state. HB 22 also prohibits the operation of any drone equipped with a lethal payload. On March 6, the Senate passed HB 22 by 38-0. The House previously approved the measure by 94-0. Governor Matt Bevin did not sign the bill, but became law without a signature on March 24. The damn thing's unanimous. It was so funny. Governor Matt Be- Bevin, he could have signed it anyway. But have you have have you sold your rear end to the feds? That's a legitimate question. Hopefully, you can answer that though to your constituents. Impact on the federal surveillance state. Although the proposed law would only apply to state and local drone use, it throws a high hurdle in front of some federal programs. According to a report by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, drones can be equipped with various types of surveillance equipment that can collect high definition. Video and still images day and night. Drones can be equipped with the techn- with technology allowing them to intercept cell phone calls, determine GPS locations, and gather license plate information. Drones can be used to determine whether individuals are carrying guns. 
Synthetic aperture radar can identify changes in the landscape, such as footprints and tire tracks. Some drugs are even equipped with facial recognition. According to research from the Center of the Study of the Drone at Bar College, 347 U.S. police, sheriff, fire, and emergency response units acquired drones between 2009 and early 2017, primarily sheriff's offices and local police departments. Much of the funding for drones at the state and local level comes from the federal government and in and of itself a constitutional violation. In return, federal agencies tap into the information gathered by state and local law enforcement through fusion centers and a federal program known as the Information Sharing Environment. According to the website, its website, the ISE, provides analysts, operators, and investigators with information needed to enhance national security. These analysts, operators, and investigators have missions need to collaborate and share information with each other and with private sector partners and our foreign allies. In other words, ISE serves as a conduit for the sharing of information gathered without a warrant. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me here. Federal government encourages and funds a network of drones at state and local levels. Sorry about that. Level across the United States, thereby gaining access to a massive data pool on Americans without having to expend the resources to collect information itself. By replacing restrictions on drone use, state and local governments limit the data available that the feds can access. Currently, 18 states, Alaska, Florida, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Maine, Montana, Nevada, North Carolina, North Dakota, Oregon, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, and Wisconsin are required law for agencies in certain circumstances to obtain a search warrant, use drones for surveillance, or to conduct a search. In a nutshell, without state or local cooperation, the feds have a much more difficult time gathering information. This represents a major blow to the surveillance state and a win for privacy. What's next? HB 22 will go into effect 90 days at the end of the 2018 legislative session. Well, and I do um, very pleased to hear that. I know the state of Florida, even Flip Flop for Scott signed that into law as well. Like I said, I call him Flip Flop because not, not, he, oh, not saying he's always wrong. But if he signs something right, I'm going to commend him. So that area I like. I was real critical of him when he signed the BDS uh, bill into law for anti-Israel uh, boycott because it violates free speech. So I'm pro-free speech, so flop is it. That's what you got to observe. But one thing I'm glad the blue guys stay done, put another notch, another dent into the federal surveillance system. That's really good. I'm very pleased to see that. And I'll be right back. Stay tuned. Woo, okay, my friends. I'm going to do one more here. And this is uh, came out today as well. It's by John W. Whitehead, who is, um, represents the Rutherf- Rutherford Institute based out of Charlottesville, Virginia. And it says here, enough is enough. If you really want to save lives, take aim at government violence. It is often that case that police shootings, instances where law enforcement officers pull the trigger on civilians are left out of the conversation on gun violence. But police officers shooting civilian counts as gun violence. Here the website from Alternet tells you all about it. Every time an officer uses a gun against an innocent or unarmed person contributes to the cultural gun violence of this country. Journalist Felisa Calico. Calico. Enough, enough. This was refrained, chanted over and over by the demonstrators who gathered to protest gun violence in America. Enough's enough. We, we need to do something about the violence that's plaguing our nation and our world. Enough's enough. The world would be a better place if there are few, fewer weapons that could kill, maim, destroy, or debilitate. Enough's enough. On March 24th, 2018, 
more than 200,000 young people took the time to march on Washington. D.C. and other cities across the country demand that their concerns about gun violence be heard. More power to them. I'm all for activism, especially if it motivates people who have been sitting silently on the sidelines for too long and get up and try to reclaim control over a runaway government. Curiously, however, although these young activists were vocal in calling for gun control legislation that requires stricter background checks and limits the kind of weapons being bought and sold by members of the public, they were remarkably silent about the gun violence perpetrated by their own government. Enough's enough. Why is no one taking aim at the U.S. government as the greatest purveyor of violence in American society and around the world? The systematic violence being perpetrated by agents of the government has done more collective harm to the American people and our liberties than any single act of terror or mass shooting. Violence has become our government's calling card, starting at the top and trickling down from more than 80,000 SWAT team raids carried out every year on the unsuspecting Americans by heavily armed black like guard. No problem. That's my friend Alice from Who's Guard. I'll be right back. Black Arbor, Co- wait, the Black Arbor Co- Commandos and the increasingly rapid militarization of local police forces across the country to the drone killings used to target insurgents. I'll be right back. All right, I had to chop my my, my, my old boy from um, Booth Garden, Alex from Booth Garden, I'm right on the corner next to Sway on Southwest Second Avenue. It's right by uh, Stash too. Cool place, good vibe, free games. Good, good time, man. I meet, I meet some good people there. So check it out. All right, I'll we'll continue on here. In enough's enough. The government even exports violence worldwide, with weapons being America's most profitable export. The indeed, indeed, the day before thousands of demonstrators. Descended on Washington, D.C. protest mass shootings, such as the one that took place at Stoneman Douglas High School. President Trump signed into law a colossal $1.3 trillion spending bill that gives the military the biggest boost in spending in more than a decade. Ironic, isn't it? Here we, we have thousands of passionate protesters raging, crying, and shouting about the need for three strict average Americans for being able to purchase and own a military-style weapons, all while the U.S. government, the same government under Trump, Obama, Bush, Clinton, and beyond, that continues to act as a shield and a shield for the military-industrial complex, embarks on a taxpayer-funded death march that will put even more guns into circulation and no one faced a thing about it. That's a fact. It's been going on for a long time. I'm like, hold on. I'm just, uh, right now, I just print the stuff up, so bear with me here. I got to flip these pages over. <laughs> Why is that? Why does the government get a free pass with more than $700 billion embarked for the military? And I'm just looking down here, including $144.3 billion for new military equipment. You can expect a whole lot more endless wars, drone strikes, bombing campaigns, civilian deaths, costly military installations, and fat paychecks for private military contractors who know exactly how to inflate invoices and take the American taxpayer for a ride. Enough's enough. You can be sure this financial windfall for America's military empire will be used to expand the police state here at home, putting more militarized guns and weapons into the hands of local police and government bureaucrats who've been trained to shoot first and ask questions later. There are now reportedly more bureaucratic non-military government civilians armed with high-tech deadly weapons than U.S. Marines. From the freebeacon.com. While Americans have jumped through an increasing number of hoops in order to own a gun, the government is arming its own civilian employees to the hilt. To the hilt with guns, ammunition, and military-style equipment authorizing them 
to make arrests and turning them, training them in military tactics. Among the agencies being supplied with night vision equipment, body armor, hollow point bullets, shotguns, drones, assault rifles, and LP gas cannons are the Smithsonian, U.S. Mint, Health and Human Services, IRS, FDA, Small Business Administration, Social Security Administration, National Oceanic and Atmos- Atmos- Atmospheric Administration, Education Department, Energy Department, Bureau of Engraving and Printing and Assortment of Other Public Universities. Seriously, why do IRS agents need all need AR-15s? Enough, enough. Remember, it was just a few months ago that President Trump aided and abetted his trusty Department of Justice henchman Jeff Sessions roll back restrictions on the government's military recycling program to the delight of the nation's powerful police unions. Under the aus- auspices of this military recycling program which was instituted decades ago and allows local police agencies to acquire military grade weaponry and equipment more than 4.2 billion dollars worth of equipment has been transformed from department defense to domestic police agencies since 1999 ironically while gun critics continue to clamor for bans on military style assault weapons High capacity magazines and armor piercing bullets expand on background checks and tough for gun trafficking laws. US military boasts all of these and more, including some weapons the rest of the world doesn't have. In the hands of government agents, whether they are members of the military, law enforcement, or other or some other government agency, these weapons have become routine parts of America's day-to-day life a byproduct of the rapid militarization of law enforcement over the past several decades. Over the course of 30 years, police officers in jackboots holding assault rifles have become fairly common in small town communities across the country. As investigative journalists Andrew Becker and J.W. Schultz revealed, many police, including beat cops, now routinely carry assault rifles. Combined with body armor and other apparel, many officers look more like combat troops serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. Daily Beast. Although these programs that allow military gifts to gift battlefield appropriate weapons, vehicles, and equipment to domestic police departments at taxpayer expense are being sold to communities as a benefit for the real purpose is to keep the defense industry churning out profits, bring police departments in line with the military, and establish a standing army. It is militarized approach to make work programs, except in this case, instead of unnecessary busy work to keep people employed, communications across America are being inundated, inundated with unnecessary drones, tanks, grenade launchers, and other military equipment better suited to the battlefield in order to fatten the bank accounts of the military industrial complex. Thanks to Trump, this transformation of America into a battlefield is only going to get worse. Get ready for more militarized police, more police shootings, more SWAT team raids, more violence in a culture already drenched with violence. Enough is enough. You won't talk about, you want to talk about gun violence? According to the Washington Post, one in 13 people by guns are killed by police. While it still technically remains legal for an average citizen to own a firearm in America, possessing one can now get you pulled over, searched, arrested, subject to all matters of surveillance, treated as a suspect without ever having committed a crime, <coughs> shot, killed at, ooh, hold on here, shot at, Killed by police. Let me see. Just trying to see here. Yeah, crime without even getting shot at, killed by police. You don't even have to have a gun or look or look alike gun, such as a BB gun, in your possession to be singled out by the police. See, you see what's going on right now? Absolutely. And some of these people don't know how to think. We'll proceed here. These are countless incidences 
that happen every day in which Americans are shot, stripped, searched, choked, beaten, tasered by police for more, little more than daring to frown, smile, question, or challenge an order. Growing numbers of unarmed people are being shot, killed for just standing in a certain way or moving a certain way or holding something, anything that police could misinterpret to be a gun or ignite some trigger sense of fear in police officers' mind has nothing to do with an actual threat to their safety. Enough is enough with alarming regularity. Unarmed men, women, children, and even pets are being gunned down by twitchy, hypersensitive, easy spooked police officers who, who shoot first and ask questions later. And all the government does is shrug and promise to do better. Killed for, stand, for standing in a shooting stance. In California, police opened fire on a and killed on and killed a man met, uh, killed a mentally challenged unarmed black man within minutes of arriving on the scene, allegedly because he removed a vape smoking device from his pocket and took a shooting stance. Killed for holding the cell phone. Police in Arizona shot a man who was running away from U.S. Marshals after he refused to drop an object that turned out to be a cell phone. Similarly, police in Sacramento fired fire 20 shots at an unarmed 22-year-old black man who was standing in his grandparents' backyard after mistaking his cell phone for a gun. Killed or carried a baseball bat. Or carried a baseball bat. Responding to a domestic disturbance call, Chicago police shot and killed 19-year-old college student Quintino LaGreer, who had reportedly been experiencing mental health problems and was carrying a baseball bat around the apartment where he and his father lived. Killed for opening the front door. Betty Jones, who lived on the floor below LaGreer, was also fairly shot, this time accidentally when she attempted to open the front door for police. Killed for running towards police with a metal spoon. In Alabama, police shot and killed a 50-year-old man who reportedly charged a police officer while holding a large metal spoon in a threatening manner. Killed for running while holding a tree branch. Georgia police shot and killed a 14 year old man wearing only shorts and tennis shoes who, when first encountered, was sitting in the woods against a tree only to start running towards police holding a stick in an aggressive manner. Killed or crawling for crawling around for crawling around naked. A lot of police shot and killed an unarmed man who has reportedly been acting deranged, knocking on doors, crawling around the ground naked. Police fired two shots at the man after he reportedly started running towards him. Killed for wearing dark pants and a base basketball jersey. Donald Thomas, a mentally disabled 27-year-old, described a general as general and child was shot and killed after police searching for a carjacked suspect reportedly wearing similar clothing. Encountering him lying motionless in the neighborhood yard. Police only opened fire with an M4 rifle after Thompson first failed to respond to a flashbang grenade and started running as of being hit by foam bullets. Killed for driving, killed for driving while deaf. In North Carolina, a state trooper shot and killed 29-year-old Daniel K. Harris, who was deaf, after Harris initially failed to pull over during a traffic stop. Killed for being homeless. Los Angeles police shot an unarmed homeless man after he failed to stop riding his bicycle and then proceeded to run from the police. Killed for branching a shoehorn. John Warana, a 95 year old World War II veteran, lived in the assisting living center, used a walker to get around, and was shot and killed by police who mistook the, shoe, the shoehorn in his hand for a two foot long machete and fire multiple beanbag rounds from shotgun at close range. Killed for having your car break down on the road. Terrence Crutcher, unarmed black, unarmed and black, was shot and killed by Oklahoma police after his car broke down on the side of the road. Crutcher was shot in the back while walking towards his car with his hands up. <coughs> Killed for holding a garden hose. California police were ordered to 6.5 million 
or to pay $6.5 million of the open fire on a man for holding the garden hose. Believed to be it to believing it to be a gun. Douglas Zerby was shot twelve times and pronounced dead on the scene. Killing for calling nine one one, Justin Damon, a forty year old yoga instructor, was shot and killed by Minneapolis police. Allegedly because let me see here. Allegedly because they were startled by a loud noise in the vicinity as she just approached their as she approached the patrol car. Damon, clad in pajamas, had called 911 to a possible assault in her neighborhood. Killed for looking for a parking spot. Richard Ferretti, a 52-year-old chef, was shot and killed by Philadelphia police, who had been alert to investigate a purple Dodge Caravan that was driving suspiciously through the neighborhood. Shot seven times for peeing outdoors. <coughs> 18-year-old for peeing... 18-year-old... Kevon Young was shot seven times by police f- from behind while urinating outdoors. Young was just zipping up his pants when he heard a commotion behind him and then found himself struck by a hall of hail of bullets from two undercover cops. Allegedly, officers mistook Young, 5'4", or 135 35 pounds, and guilty of nothing more than taking a leak outdoors for a 6-foot, 200-pound murder suspect who was they who they later apprehended. Young was charged with a felony resisting arrest and two counts of assaulting a peace officer. Hmm. I'm gonna got one more page here. That is what passes for police in America today, folks. It's only getting worse. Every time one of these scenarios, police could have resorted to less lethal tactics. They could have acted with reason and calculation instead of reacting with a killer instinct. They could have attempted to de-escalate de- de- and defuse whatever perceived threat caused them to fear for their lives enough to react with lethal force. That police instead cho- chose to fairly resolve these encounters by using their guns on fellow citizens to speak volumes about what is wrong with policing in America today, where police officers are being dressed in the trappings of war, drilled in the deadly art of combat, and trained to look upon every individual they interact uh, act with as an armed threat in every situation as a deadly force encounter in the making. Remember, to a hammer, all the world looks like a nail. We're not gonna just get getting hammered, however. We're getting killed, execution style. Enough is enough. When you train, when you train police to shoot first and ask questions later, whatever is a pet, a family pet, a child with a toy gun, or an old man with a cane, they're going to shoot to kill. This is the fallout from teaching police to assume the worst case scenario and react with fear to anything that poses the slightest threat, imagined or real. This is what comes from teaching police to view themselves as soldiers in the battlefield and those they're supposed to serve as enemy combatants. <coughs> this is what comes from teaching, from teaching people, teaching police to view themselves as soldiers on the battlefield and those they're supposed to serve as enemy combatants. I think I already said that. This is the end result of a lopsided criminal justice system that fails to hold the government and its agents accountable for misconduct. Want to save lives? Start by doing something to save lives of your fellow citizens who are being gunned down every day by police who are trained to shoot first, ask questions later. You want to cry about the lives lost during mass shootings? Cry about the lives lost as a result of the violence by being being perpetrated by the U.S. government here at home and abroad. If gun control activists really want the country to reconsider its relationship with guns and violence, then it needs to start with a serious discussion about the role our government has played and continues to play in contributing to the culture of violence. If the American people are being called on a scale back on their weapons, then I, then, then as I make it clear in my book, Battlefield America, The War on the American People, the government and its cohorts, the police, the various government agencies, they're not now armed, they're now armed to the hilt 
military, the military, the defense contractors, etc., need to do the same. It's time to put an end to the government's reign of terror. Enough is enough. You don't have to play by the rules of the corrupt politicians, manipulative media, and brainwashed peers. Pretty hardcore indeed. Jason Whitehead always, John Whitehead always does a good job in doing his interpretations. And I recommend everyone to join on newsbuzz.com or the Rutherford Institute to, to subscribe at the least. You get some good information on but on his writings and even his videos on Newsbuds, very fantastic um, presentations. And of course, I like to tell folks to look at, try to check out this book called um, Arrest Proof Yourself. And it's based on a, a, an, um, a former, I think a retired attorney named Dale Carson, who was a former Miami cop. And he broke the case, the Miami Rivers cop case, when he was an FBI agent. Very fantastic information on how the police are being trained more aggressively. And am I going to be condemning the police, every police officer out there? No, absolutely not. But we always got questioned how they're being taught, programmed, trained, and look at you as everyone as an enemy. And that's very dangerous. We need to go back to the peace officer status. And one thing I always questioned was the military industrial complex. So all these folks out there that want to protest and that's enough, you should be looking at this because it affects every single one of us. That is a fact. And, and, and like I said before, look what the customs officers, the BSO deputies done at Douglas High School. Stood down, didn't do a damn thing. They failed, they failed their duties of protecting people the best of their ability. And you can't really sue them. You can't sue the bar sheriff's office under sovereign immunity tort liability for the statute, which is for the statute 768-428. If you want to learn more about police protection myths in Florida, I'll just give you an example. Look up Wong versus the city of Miami. I know I've talked about this a few times, but definitely everyone has the right to know the truth. Is there some good folks in these institutions? Absolutely. I have I can't I can't I can't say bad about every single one, but we got a lot of tyranny going on and people worried about a horrific event gonna make a mockery of all of us. Remember, when when government has more weapons than the people, that's that's the road to tyranny towards march towards death. Death by government. Study your history, folks, before speaking out. Like I said before, the past is today's greatest teacher. That is it. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share through social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you're sending something that's interesting you may want to check out, whatever you do, please send your correspondence to Corum. Keep me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Speaker, iHeartRadio, Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network, Minds.com, Future Club, Future Net Club. I, I know I, I forgot to say it the last episode. <laughs> All right, that's that's a good. That's another good one. And you can hit me if you want to be a patron. Patreon.com forward slash Loki Luck the third with three eyes in the end, like Roman numeral three. And you could even hit me a gab g a b dot a i the free speech freer speech version of Twitter. In addition, you can email me at Loki Luck number three at gmail.com or anyone with a Proton Mail account that's the encrypted one Loki Luck numbers 03 at ProtonMail.com Alright my friends once again thank you for your time plus always remember that the maniac resistance is something for the soul and can liberate humanity until next time take care of yourselves keep on spreading the love may your guardian spirits be with you